recording here. Looks like we're good to go. Um, and let's let's start section 3.9. So last time we went over the um, starter question and it had a bunch of information about coming up with formulas that relate variables. All of these were pretty much pre-calculus questions until we get to right here when it talks about how would we write down the derivative of this particular variable with respect to that particular variable? Okay, and then we mentioned that the idea behind this section is very simple. They are all story problems, but they all revol revolve around the same idea. If you can find an equation that relates variables, then you can find an equation that relates their derivatives or their rates of change. Okay, and it's that simple. The hard part usually is coming up with the equation that relates the variables. Now on some of them, it's, it's really not too bad. So let's take a look at the first problem and let's think about this. So here's what we've got. Um, and I made sure last time that, that your, uh, yours matched up with mine, right? Okay, with the numbers. So five miles and 10 miles and this is three miles per hour. Okay, so an oil rig springs a leak and the oil spreads in a circular disc around the rig. So we'll consider that's a, kind of an idealized situation pretty calm water, but there's a wind going, in this case, all directions, so it pushes it out in a circle, okay? So pretty ideal here, okay? The radius of the oil slick is uh, increasing at a rate of three miles per hour. So every hour, the radius of this oil slick gets three miles bigger, okay? How fast is the area of the slick increasing when the slick has a radius of five miles and then 10 miles? So let's think about what's going on here and let's uh, consider the information that we've got. Let's put the rig right here and then oil is spreading out from the rig at three miles per hour. So if we let an hour go by, we've got a circular disc about that big. Okay, let a little bit more time go by and we add a little bit to the radius. Okay, pretend I'm drawing nice concentric circles. Okay, but this circular disk is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, and here's what we've got. It says the radius is increasing at a rate. Somebody says rate in a calculus class, so you know that's a derivative. Okay, so the radius is changing at a rate of three miles per hour. Now, the fact that we've got three miles per hour is a big deal. Okay, because you'll notice that what's in the denominator, the hours, that's what we would have had to differentiate with respect to. This is a derivative with respect to time. Now, let's read the, the problem a little more carefully. It says the radius of the oil slick is increasing at this rate. So this is a rate of change for the radius. So this is dr d something. And what did we decide we're differentiating with respect to? Time. So this is dr dt. They just gave us the derivative of radius with respect to time. And notice the units. Radius is in miles. Time is in hours. Okay? So then, like any good story problem, it ends with a question. It says, how fast is the, uh, is the uh, area of the slick increasing? How fast is the area of that oil slick increasing? Well, let's take a look at the picture that we've got here. What shape is it? A circular disk. Okay? So we've got this circular oil slick. Oil slick. Okay. How would we find the area of that circular oil slick? Yeah, area equals pi r squared. Okay, now let's think about this. Is the radius changing? It is. So that, that r has got to be a variable. Okay. Is the area changing whenever the radius changes? Yes, it is. So that's also a variable. So we have an equation that relates the variables. Now let's find an equation that relates to the derivatives. So I can differentiate this, and we do this kind of implicitly, okay? But with respect to what variable? Do I differentiate with respect to A or R or some other variable? R is changing. A is changing also, so that well, argument can... Well, I only have... I only have okay. So these two equations, okay, I've, I've got it, you're right, there is an R in this one, but it's the derivative of R. With respect to what variable? These are both, think about this, if you were just, say you flew out there and you were looking at it from a helicopter, and you're looking at it, okay, you could see it getting bigger. So the area is changing, 
The more time goes by, the larger the area. Okay? The radius is changing. The more time goes by, the bigger the radius is. Okay? These are both changing with respect to time, and this little thing right here, the denominator on that rate that they gave us, tells us that we're going to differentiate this with respect to time. Okay? In fact, to my knowledge, there's not a single problem on the assignment. Nearly always related rate problems are done with respect to time. Okay? So we're always going to just differentiate with respect to time. So what is the, the der derivative of A with respect to T? DA dt. And if we just stopped right there and stared at that for a second, we should know what that means. That is the rate of change of area with respect to time. That's how much bigger or how much smaller, how fast the area is increasing or how fast the area is decreasing based on a given unit of time, in this case, hours. Okay? And then over here, we find the derivative of this. We've got a constant out front, power function here, so this is going to be 2 pi r. Do we stop there? No, you don't stop there. Because we're carrying out the chain rule completely. Remember, we're not differentiating with respect to r. We're differentiating with respect to t. So this is going to be dr dt. So this was the equation that related the variables in the problem. This is an equation that relates the derivatives of those variables or relates the rates of change of those variables. Again, that's why we call this section related rates. The rate of change for these variables is related through this equation. Okay? Now, in the original problem, we had two variables. How many variables do we have in this related rate equation? Three. I don't know what dA dt is. I don't know what r is specifically, but we do over here based on what the problem tells us. It changes from uh, part A to part B. And dr dt. Now, if you have an equation with three variables, how many do they have to give you so you can figure out what's left? they got to give you two. So if I had a related rate equation with eight variable parts, how many would they have to give us? They'd have to give us seven or enough information that we could figure out what seven of them are, plug those in, solve for the remaining one. Okay? Got it? No. Six, yes. Eight, no. Okay. Good? Okay. So here's what we're going to do. This is the equation we're focusing on. This is the key to figuring out all of this information. Um, let's figure out these two parts. They're really quite simple. So let's figure out what dA dt is, the rate of change of area when the radius is 5. So this is going to be two, 2 pi times radius is 5. And I'm going to put the units on there. That's miles. And then the rate of change is a constant 3 miles per hour. Okay, if I do the math on that, I get dA dt equals, well, let's see, this is going to be 10 pi times 3. So this is going to be 30 pi, and look at the units, miles squared per hour. So when this is 5 miles in radius, I'm adding about, do the multiplication, somewhere a little bit less than 100 square miles every hour. So around the fifth, around when it's five miles, so about an hour and 40 minutes after the slick happened, I'm adding 100 miles of oil slick every hour. That's the rate of change when, it, when the radius is five miles. Good? Okay. Let's do the other one. What about when it's 10 miles? Just twice as big. So just twice as big. So dA dt would be, this is going to be 2 pi, so this is going to be 10, and this is 3. So I multiply those together, I end up with 60 pi, and again, it would be square miles per hour. Okay. So when the radius is 10 miles, what's the rate of change of area? Do the multiplication. Yeah, 180, 190 square miles. Okay. Now, think about it in terms of this. The radius is just kind of creeping out at 3 miles per hour. every. So every hour, it's increasing 3 miles. Okay. If the radius is getting bigger at a steady pace, why do we change from just under 100 
square miles per hour to just under 200 square miles per hour. Why does that happen? If the radius is getting bigger at a steady rate, why does, why does the area not get bigger at a steady rate? Why isn't it just, oh, it's adding 100 miles per hour or 100 square miles every hour? Why does that change? Why does it go from 30 pi to 60 pi? Yeah. Because okay, the area formula is squared. Stop and think about it this way. I'm going to blow this up just a little bit so we can take a look at this. Okay. Let's say I take this smaller ring and I add, so I try and add a uniform amount. Let me add just a little sliver around the outside that's about that big. Okay. What if I come out here and I do one around this one okay, and try and do that the same? Try and stay a uniform distance. So even though the radius changed the same amount, which of these two little rings, this one right here or this one right here, which one of those added more area? Yeah, the one on the bigger circle. Okay, It's kind of like either, say, you take a roll of tape or something like that. Okay, If you take a brand new roll of scotch tape or electrical tape or something like that and you pull off you know, one thin outside band there, it's pretty long. What happens when you get to the very center, to the little cardboard on the inside? Yeah, hardly at all. Okay, We could talk about toilet paper, but that's not as fun a subject, right? Okay, Same thing happens there. In fact, even more dramatic, because you think about how big a toilet paper roll is to start out with versus how big it is to finish. Okay, One little circumference on the outside when it starts is way bigger than when it's almost done. Okay? All right, any questions there? Okay, so the textbook has this little step-by-step -step process that you can go through um, in order to figure these out. So let's just um, run through these and make sure we understand what they mean. Okay, first one, no-brainer, read the problem, okay, and read it very carefully. No hope to solve the problem if you don't know what it is, so we want to read the problem first. The next thing is really important. On most of these, you're going to be able to draw a diagram, okay? Those diagrams are going to be really important, okay? Introduce notation. Assign symbols to all quantities that are functions of time. In other words, figure out what variables you're going to use. And it's a really good idea to choose variables that represent what you're looking for. Okay? So if you're looking for a height, use an H. Okay? If you're looking for a horizontal distance, probably an X. A vertical distance, maybe a Y. Okay? Just to remind you of those. Express the given information and the required uh, rates in terms of derivatives. Okay? So you're going to go through and figure out, okay, what parts are constants, and did they give me any rates, okay? So you're going to figure out, hey, did they give me a DADT? Did they give me a DRDT? Things like that, okay? And this really is the crux of the whole thing, okay? These are all just preliminary steps, okay? Step number five says, write an equation that relates the various quantities of the problem. Whether those quantities are variables or constants, okay, we want to come up with an equation that relates those quantities. If necessary, use geometry. Okay, So like we talked about up above in the starter question, some of those formulas are going to come in handy. Okay, Use those to, um, if necessary, use geometry of the situation to eliminate one of the, uh, one of the variables by substitution. Okay, And that may or may not be important. We, we're going to do that at some point. So sometimes it's going to be easier, just as normal, Simplify things geometrically or simplify things algebraically before doing the calculus. If you can eliminate the number of variables, you're drastically going to reduce the number of derivatives you have, okay? Or rates you have in the end problem. Remember that one we said, what if they give you eight unknown quantities? Okay, you can cut that down to four or something like that, you're in better shape. So again, the idea here is relate the derivatives. Or sorry. Relate the variables on this one. Relate the variables. And then the next one is use the chain rule to differentiate. And once we differentiate, then we'll have an equation that relates the derivatives. And again, on each one of these, we're going to differentiate with respect to time. Time is going to be the quantity that drives all this. And then it says substitute the given information into the resulting equation and solve for the unknown rate. Okay, we're always looking for an unknown rate. In this particular case, in example one, we were looking for the rate of change of area with respect to time. We were looking for DADT. Okay, all right, any questions? Okay, go ahead and flip that over. Let's take a look at the next problem, and I want to point this out. 
Okay, I've taught this for years. I would say this is the biggest struggle people have. Okay, they can't keep straight the quantities that are variables and the quantities that are constants. Okay, so which uh, quantities are variables and which ones are constants? And this baffles me to some extent because if you if you stop and think about the situation, most of the situations are pretty easy to understand what's going on. Okay, hopefully everything that we do today, after reading the problem, drawing some pictures and stuff like that, you're going to get what's going on in the situation. Okay, but then coming up with an equation, for some reason people will put variables where there shouldn't be variables, or they'll put constants where there shouldn't be constants. Okay, so you want to think about it carefully. If a quantity is changing over time, if it's 7 here and then 14 here, it's changing. It is not always 7 and it's not always 14. Use a variable for that. But if in a problem there's a quantity like this measurement is always 19 and it stays 19 and it never changes, that's a constant. Okay? So make sure you think about what's changing in the situation. If it's changing, it's a variable. If it's not changing, then it's a constant. Okay? All right. Uh, let's see. And then make sure you remember to carry out the chain rule okay, on each problem. Okay, so here's what we've got. A hot air balloon is rising straight up from a level field, and it's tracked by a range finder 500 feet from the liftoff point. Okay, at the moment, the range finder's angle of elevation is pi fourths. The angle is increasing at a rate of 0.14 radians per minute. How fast is the balloon rising at that moment? Okay. So let's think about this for just a second. A range finder in this particular case is talking about somebody standing and what they're doing is, another name for this would be an inclinometer, okay? What it's doing is it's measuring the angle of incline, okay? So somebody's looking through a little scope or something like that. There's something dangling down that says, okay, the angle here is zero, and then maybe 10 degrees and 30 degrees and 45 degrees and whatnot, okay? Of course, we're doing it in radians because this is calculus, right? And we like to make things complicated. <laughs> okay, so um, let's look at this diagram and let's figure out what's going on. So it says the range finder is 500 feet from the liftoff point. So this distance right here is 500, at least initially. Don't write anything yet. And then it says it rises straight up. So perfectly windless day. We're really simplifying the situation. It's just going to go straight up. Okay, so that angle right there, it's even indicated as a 90 degree angle. And then what we want to know is, how fast is it rising at this particular time? So, should we label this right here, don't write anything down yet, should we label that as pi fourths? And should we come over here and say, hey, you know what, this is going to be pi fourths, this is going to be 500, and just go at it like that? No, okay, shouldn't do that, okay? Think about what's changing. Okay, is this distance right here, this horizontal distance from where we're taking the observation to the liftoff point, is that changing or is that constant? constant. That's constant. That's going to be 500. Okay. Is the angle changing or is it staying the same? It is changing. So we're going to leave that as a theta. Okay. And what about the height over here? That's changing because it's going up, right? So here's the correct picture with the correct variables and constants. That's going to be theta, that's going to be 500, and this is going to be y. Now, in this problem, are we concerned with the direct line distance, like how far is it from the range finder straight to the uh, hot air balloon? No. I suppose we could try and figure it out, but is it important in this problem? No, because what they want to know is, um, how fast is the balloon rising? So, we want to know, what is rate of change of this height right here? Or what variable did we use here? So we want dy dt. That's what we're after. What did they give us? They gave us d theta dt. Okay. And they also gave us, at the particular time in question, theta is pi fourths. Okay. Now, when I do these problems, here's what I like to do. I like to ignore all of this information. 
I like to get the diagram, convince myself that the diagram is right, and then I like to start working on it. Okay? So, if this is the diagram, ignore that whole thing, and let's pretend you need to come up with an equation that relates the variables. What equation relates that angle with the side across from it to the side next to it? Tangent. So, tangent of theta is equal to y over 500. Tangent of an angle is equal to the opposite side over the adjacent side, right? Okay. And didn't we do this problem in the starter question last week? We did. Okay. Do we have an equation that relates the variables? Yes, we do. Can we find an equation that relates the derivatives of those variables? Yes, we can. All we need to do is differentiate. Now, uh, it doesn't matter, but I want you to consider a couple of things. First of all, is that the easiest way to write this relationship? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, if you wanted to slide the 500 out front, that would make it a constant of 500 right here rather than a constant of 1 500th. That might be okay. And the other thing to consider is this. Finding the derivative of an equation with just two variables in it is not very difficult. Okay. So do we need to worry about using the geometry of this situation to eliminate one of the variables or something like that? No. Okay. Two variables is the bare minimum, isn't it? Okay, all right, so let's go ahead. Um, we want to find the derivative here. So the derivative of tangent theta, that's going to be secant squared theta d theta dt. Remember, we're differentiating with respect to time. Then I want to find the derivative of y over 500 with respect to time. So that's going to be 1 500th, oops, 500th. And what's the derivative of y with respect to time? dy dt. Okay. Okay. How many variables? Three. How many do they have to give us, or at least enough information that we can figure out so we can solve an equation with three variables in it? They've got to give us at least two. So let's come up here and take a look. Okay. What is d theta dt? dt? What did they tell us it was? 0.14, whoops, 0.14 radians per minute, okay? And what was theta? Pi fourths. Now, you can see in this problem it would have been very advantageous because we're looking for dy dt. It would have been very nice to slide that 500 over here. So let's do this. Let's do 500 secant squared theta d theta dt. That's going to be dy dt. And then let's plug this information in and we'll have our answer. So this is going to be 500. Let's see. We could figure this one out. Okay? Or we could change this to 1 over cosine of pi fourths quantity squared. And what is d theta dt? 0 0.14. Uh, let's see. What is... The cosine of pi fourths. Radical 2 over 2. Okay, So this would be radical 2 over 2, which I would flip over and multiply, right? So this is going to be 500. This is going to be 2 over radical 2 quantity squared times 0.14, and that's going to be dy dt. So let's see what we get here. Let's see. That's going to be 4 over 2. So that's going to be 2. So that's going to be 1,000 times 0.14. So that's going to be 140. And what would the units be here? Yep, it is feet per minute. Because remember, this is 500 feet. Okay, And this was a rate per time. So this is feet per minute. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Sure. So plug in the so for um so really say that you said can be taken later in the stream from the other units or other variables? Other units? So this is, this is one area that gets slightly sticky. This is 5, I'll, I'll do the math up here. Let me change colors. So this is 500 feet 
Okay. Um, the next one is doesn't have units. That's just going to be four over two, right? Once we once we flip this over, so that's just a two. And then this one is 0.14. This is radians per minute. Okay. And so the question is, why don't I write feet radians per minute? Okay. And that is because if you look at this diagram, this is essentially the radius of a circle. Okay. And we're always, I mean, think about the trig functions. They're in terms of x's, y's, and r's. This 500 feet right here is a radius. So we could say this is 500 feet in one radius or one radian, and then this will cancel with that. A lot of books just ignore that, and they say it's a, uh, radians are a real unit, so they just go away. Okay? It's just a way of measuring an angle that's a real number, so we can just drop those. I kind of like this. If somebody asks, this is the explanation I give. It's a conversion factor. Okay? What we're doing is we're taking this uh, triangle represented by the cosine of pi fourths, Okay, and we're scaling that up by a factor of 500. Okay, so it's a it's a conversion factor. 500 feet is one radius. 500 feet, one radius. The radius cancels with the radians. Then we have feet on top, minutes on the bottom. Okay. Anything else? Okay. All right. Let's take a look at the next problem. This one doesn't have a diagram, but I did break this down into three different parts. I've got three sentences here, which is pretty typical for these type of problems. Okay, It'll give us a, su a sentence like this. A cylindrical water tank is 6 meters in diameter and 8 meters tall. Well, what does that tell us? If we have to solve that problem, if we read and think about that sentence, what does that tell us? Okay, so, so it tells us maybe the volume, but before we can figure out the volume, we'd probably have to know... What shape, what to draw. The fact that it's a cylindrical water tank tells us that we're going to draw a shape. Okay, And it also gives us, and this is important, it gives us the dimensions. Okay, The tank started full, but the water is leaking out at a rate, whenever you see that word, clue into that, a rate of 2 cubic meters per minute. 2 cubic meters per minute. This tells us what's changing. And it gives us a rate. And clue into the things here. This is a time on the bottom, as it will always be. And meters cubed, that is a measurement for what? Volume. So they just gave us the rate of change of volume. They gave us dv dt. Okay? How fast is the water level changing? Water level, the depth of the water, the height of the water, if you want to think of it that way. After five minutes. Okay? And this tells us what we're looking for. Okay? So let's do this problem. Let's draw a tank. That is 6 meters in diameter. That is, what did it say, 8 meters tall? And the water's leaking out, right? Okay. So it started off full, but let's represent what would happen if we let you know five minutes go by. The water's going to be about like this, right? Well, if they gave us dv dt, we better have an equation to begin with that has a what in it? A v, a volume, right? We better come up with an equation for the volume. So if we're going to find the volume of, well, let's see. Do we want to find the volume of the tank or do we want to find the volume of the water? The water, right? It's not the tank. The tank doesn't change shape. Okay, all the tank does is hold the water in this particular shape. And it's a very simple shape. It's just a cylinder. It's just a can. All right? So we want the volume of the water. So I'm going to do that in blue. The volume of the water is, how do you find the volume of a right circular cylinder? Area of the base times the height. Well, the base is in what shape? A circle. So that's going to be pi r squared. 
And what about the height? H. Now, are any of those things changing? Are any of those things staying the same? Because I've got three variables floating around here, and if I don't have to work with three variables, I don't want to. Okay? So take a good look. This is the water, mind you. Is the volume of the water changing? Yeah, they told us it was. They told us that dv dt, in essence, was 2 meters cubed per minute. Is the radius of the water changing? No. What is the radius of the water? Radius of the water is 3. Okay, so we'll plug that in. Is the height of the water changing? Yes, it is. Okay, so this particular shape is holding this water with the same radius all the way down, so we can change that to a 3, but the volume is changing and therefore the height is changing. Okay, so here's our formula. V equals, this would be 9 pi h. How many variables now? Two. Okay, and we like that. Okay, now um, we want to catch this on this particular problem. This is not a big deal here, but it is a big deal on some problems. Okay, is the volume increasing or is the volume decreasing? It is decreasing. How do we normally represent derivatives of things that are decreasing? What type of derivatives do they have? They normally have negative derivatives. So it's not a gigantic deal on this particular one, okay, because we're just looking for a single quantity the way the question's been asked, okay? But it would be good if we got used to the fact that if something is decreasing in size, we use a negative rate to indicate that. If it's increasing in size, we use a positive rate to indicate that. Any questions? Piece of cake from here on out. Look at this. dv dt equals 9 pi. Well, gosh, this is just dh dt. How many variable parts to this related rate equation? Two. How many did they give us? One. Let's plug it in. So this is going to be negative 2 meters cubed per minute. This is going to be 9 pi over here, and I get dh dt. So when I finish this off and solve this algebraically, I'm going to have negative 2 over 9 pi. And let's see, what are the units? Rate of change of the height with respect to time. Should be meters cubed? No. Meters squared? Just meters. Meters per minute. Okay. Do you catch where they went? Okay. This right here, that's three meters squared. So this is really nine square meters. When we divided by nine, I'll do it right here, nine meters squared. Okay. That's going to cancel with one of those. So we end up with negative two over nine pi meters per minute. Okay, if this is a story problem and we have an option of writing what the answer is, can somebody throw that into the calculator for us? What'd you get? Okay. So, um, let's see, a twentieth of a meter every minute? Somewhere in that neighborhood? Maybe an eighteenth of something like that? Okay. Going down pretty darn slow. Okay, so a couple inches a minute. I mean, this this tank is eight meters tall. Okay, it's about twenty-five feet tall, and it's going down a couple inches every minute. Okay, all right. Any questions there? Yeah. The what? Excellent question. What about this five-minute part? Did we forget something? Does it matter? Nope, doesn't matter at all. Okay? It will matter on problems in the future, okay, if problems are different shapes. But think about how this shape is held together all the way down in exactly the same cross section because of this tank. This tank is the same shape all the way down. Okay? So if we let five minutes go by, it's going to be down to here decreasing at a rate of 0 0.07 meters per minute. What if I let it get all the way down there? Same thing. Okay. What if this were shaped a little bit more like, kind of like a bathtub or something like that? What if it got down to this point 
and then kind of went to here. It would go down at the same rate all the way down to here, and then what happens once I hit here, as long as the volume is changing at the same rate? Does, does the height slow down, okay, or does it speed up as far as how fast it's decreasing? Speeds up. Think about when you empty a bathtub. Okay? Even though the back is slanted like this, it's pretty much the same shape all the way till you get to the bottom. And then that last little bit is slanted very shallow. Okay? So it's going to, I mean, you can see it go down. It'll speed up a little bit. But once you get to here, what happens to the water? I mean, it races down there. Okay? I mean, it really goes down fast. Okay? It's not changing. I mean, in physics, you could learn about, there's something called Torselli's Law and stuff like that. It doesn't change at the same, uh, the volume doesn't change at the same rate because when it's full, there's more pressure pushing it out. Okay? Stuff like that. Yeah, we're simplifying the situation. Okay, anything else? Okay, let's take a look at the next one. And let's see what we've got here. Yeah, this will be good. Perfect. Got through three problems. Okay. So a police car is approaching a right-angled intersection from the north while chasing some speeding criminals who have turned the corner at the intersection and are headed west, are headed east. Okay? The police car, when the police car is 0.6 miles north of the intersection and the criminals are 0.8 miles east of the intersection, the police uh, determine with radar and a calculus student who's a complete nerd sitting in the back, okay, that the distance between them and the criminals is increasing at 20 miles per hour. If the police are moving at 60 miles per hour, at the instant the measurement is taken, how fast are the criminals going? Tons and tons of information there. Okay? All right. So let's, let's take a look. Let's draw a picture first of all. Um, let's see. The police car is approaching a right angle intersection from the north. So they're coming from above. And the, the criminals turn the corner and they're heading east. So here's what we've got. Police are coming this direction, here's the intersection, and then the criminals are heading that direction, okay? So the police are over here, the criminals are over here. Okay, is this distance between the police car and the intersection, is that changing or is it staying constant? Okay. They said uh, when it was 0.6 miles north, do we care about that? We're going to use that, but are they always 0.6 miles north? No, that's a variable. Okay, the criminals are 0.8 miles east. Okay, do we leave that 0.8, or is that distance the criminals are from the intersection? Is that changing? Changing. So that's a variable. And then we're also interested in the direct line of sight, the distance between the two of those. Okay, so we could use. Well, let's see. What variable do you want to use here? We could use D, but that's going to look a little bit funny. We're going to be finding derivatives. We probably don't want to write D D D T. Okay, sounds a little funny. Okay, let's call it S. Okay, just so we can keep those straight. Is S changing? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's going to be changing. In fact, it tells us that the distance between them and the criminals is increasing at a rate of 20 miles per hour. Okay, this distance is changing. They just told us in the, in the problem that it was changing. Questions? Yeah. Right. So, so the criminals are getting further away from the police. No, that would have been fun. Good? Okay. Um, do we have an equation that would relate those three variables? Yeah. Um, S squared equals P squared plus C squared, right? Now, could I take that and rearrange it a whole bunch of different ways? Yeah. You bet I could. Okay. Um, what are we after in this problem? We're after how fast the criminals are going. Okay. So we're asking for dc dt. That's what we want. Okay. We want dc dt. So algebraically, we could leave it like this or... We could solve for C, get C on one side by itself. Now, I'm going to go through and do this problem a couple of different ways. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write um, C squared equals 
S squared minus P squared. Is that okay? Okay. And then let's go ahead and differentiate. Watch what we get. And watch the uniformity that we were talking about when we did the chain rule. DC dt times 2C. I just wrote the dt out front. Uh, let me do this. So they all look the same. 2C dc dt. 2S ds dt minus 2p dp dt. Nice and uniform. Okay, what can we get rid of? Uh, we have ds dt. We're given that. Okay, anything else? Okay, we'll, we'll get there in just a second. I'm just talking, look at the equation. What do they all have? They all have a 2, so you could drop the 2 if you wanted. Okay, we'll get to that in just a second. Okay, let's read this problem. When the police car is, so at the time in question, the police car is six miles north. So at time in question, P is 0.6. The criminals, C is 0.8. And police have determined, uh, let's see, the distance, that straight line distance. So we figured out that, or they tell us, ds dt equals 20. The police are moving at 60 miles per hour. dp dt is equal to 60. How many variables here? Six. How many do I have? Oh, careful. I only have four. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and drop the twos. Is that okay? Um, do I know what C is? Point eight. Do I know DCDT? No, nope, that's what we're looking for. Do I know S? You can solve for S. That's the first one we've run into. I don't have S and I need S. How can I solve for S? Pythagorean theorem. This would be 0. 0.6 squared plus 0. 0.8 squared. And if you've been paying attention, do you recognize these? Made this work out pretty nicely. Um, this is a 3, 4, 5 triangle. This is 3 fifths. This is 4 fifths. So this would be five-fifths. This would be one, okay? So we know S is one, and ds dt is 20, and then this is going to be minus P, which is 0. 0.6, and then dp dt. Before you go any further, I want you to watch. This is a big deal. If this is going to be positive because this is increasing, and if ds dt was increasing and we represented that with a positive, take a good look at P. Is that distance that the police are from the intersection, is it getting bigger or is it getting smaller? It's getting smaller. So what should be on the PDT? It should be a negative. Put a negative there and this problem will work out and make sense. Don't put a negative there and you're going to get the answer wrong. So dc dt, how fast the criminals are going with respect to time, is going to be 20 minus, let's see, isn't that, uh, that would be positive, 36 divided by 0. 0.8. And what do you get? Fifty-six divided by point eight. Thank you for the help. Seventy. Seventy miles per hour. Yeah. Um, they told us right here. They said the straight line distance between them and the criminals is increasing. So they're telling us ds dt is twenty miles per hour. It's part of the problem. Okay. No, the the uh, the 
the rate the rate of change of this distance between them, a straight line distance. Okay, that's what's changing here. Yeah. Because because this quantity right here, we used p to represent the distance the police were from the intersection, and that distance is getting smaller, so that quantity is decreasing in size, so it's negative. Okay. What I'd like you to do is do this. What if I took this equation and I'll change colors here? What if I actually solved it for C? So I said C equals the square root of S squared minus P squared. Over here I get dc dt, and what would this be? 1 over 2 square root S squared minus P squared times what? 2s ds dt minus 2p dp dt. Do we know s? We can find it. Do we know p? Yep. Do we know s? Again, do we know ds dt and do we know p and dp dt? Plug into that one and you'll get the exact same answer. In fact, the quantity that you end up throwing in your calculator is going to look very, very similar. Okay? So get started on the assignment. Maybe do a couple of them. Think about what we talked about here. We'll finish this up tomorrow. I hope to finish with maybe 10 minutes left or so um, and, and have questions. All right? Thank you very much.